The tragic body, made up to look like a black-faced monster on Ethiopian sunset, a stage present in her stage, just a real backyard, America's own cloaked and cloacal backyard, the joke of impersonation, taken somehow beyond itself, a real-life parody of that parody, who was Uncle Tom, and who was Uncle Tom's nemesis. It all seems so comfortable. Normal sea ascribes atrocity, that suit jacket stuck on the back of the chair behind the victim's head. Terrible, arbitrary intimacies of the process, bringing questions. Did they make him up in the same spirit that children make an effigy of Guy Fawkes? Or did those who played with this corpse feel that they were making a sculpture, sitting in a rocking chair in the innocent sunlight, some giant bowl, this poor dead body a prop for white pathologies and really excess? But the prop cannot stand alone, it must be propped up. The body still soft, still pliant, the head will not be still, lolled about, and so must be held in place with a camera with a long stick, a piece of two by four, a piece of lumber that could have been used for any old construction job. On the right, a white human fragment, a white hand holding the wood and the dead black head in place, strong sunlight cast shadows on the crack of the wall behind, and we have darkness visible. A new hell in broad daylight, a sunny day in America's backyard. The head and body of the white master of ceremonies and the body of the black court thrown together in black silhouettes. The sun performing its own secret ministry, obscene egalitarian necrophile alchemy, a live white body and a dead black equivalent, share shadow substance in the life of the picture post card. Outrageous intermingling, photographic collapse. Strange visibility burst in the speculative possibility. But how do we go into it? I don't want to elaborate. In fact, I don't know what I've just done. I don't know what to do with it, why I ever looked into it, not any part of it. Look on what you should not look on, then look on and again. What words, a language of scholarship, of analysis, of theory, of interpretation, giving meanings where there was already excessive meaning, laying out a parallel life of words that must always come up short. Words fail, have nothing decent to say, and no way of saying it, when confronted by the space inhabited by these postcards. Is it better to stop talking, to put on a dumb show, silently exposed in silence, this peculiar archive? Let's have some silence. A minute silence. Even this act of distortion, to play around with these postcards, two-faced little objects, to spray them around the walls and surfaces like this, to take them from their own proper dark and make them into public spaces, does violence to images which are already so saturated in violence, so waylaid by voyeurism as to be unapproachable. One thing to cling on to, each one of these images was sent from A to B. There's always the act of clinging to facts. From 1818 to 1930, the North American Postal Services are disseminating a mass produced photographic archive which consisted of photographs of lynchings. The photographs are almost entirely of young African American men. There are some very rare pictures of lynched African American women, and a small number showing the lynching of whites, usually relatively newly arrived European immigrants accused of rape. Some postcards are simply seen it and would not be known as lynching images, except that printed descriptions or handmade ink inscriptions determined that they show the places where victims had been lynched, or the places where crimes were supposed to have been committed. Occasionally, if the lynching victim had murdered or been accused of murder, then postcards of his victims, or supposed victims, were also circulated, together with imagery of violent retribution. These examples create little nexuses of imagistic exchange, Bundles of narrative which mix and match postcard subgenres. Yet the vast majority of these lynching postcards displayed images of dead black bodies. They were so called trophy photographs showing the black body off, 
as a degraded and fallen form over which the white hunter avenger acquires, transforms, mutilates, fragments and disseminates, as in some bizarre parody of the Catholic fetishization of the sacred reliquary. The most usual representations are of the hanging body suspended in midair, often before a crowd, and frequently the crowds contain young children. Sometimes the black body is displayed in exactly the manner in which a white hunter's display would display the bodies of big gay and African safari photographs. If the victim had been burned, then the burned tree stump would form the centerpiece of the image. Occasionally there are photographic postcards showing the ashes of the burned lynching victim being ritualistically scattered in the place of their crime, or their supposed crime. What space does this ceremony occupy? The space of the regicide family? Are they signs of the atavistic survival rooted in race hatred of the desire to perform the theatricalized social terror? This conference invited us to be ambitious and to come with both broad explorations of the latter forms and mediated exchanges, dramatized inscriptions and treasured material objects. These postcards seem to laugh blinkly at the categories set out. They provide numerous examples of all these features. But what should we do with such perverse mediation, such obscene dramatic inscription, and with treasured objects which should never have been created, let alone have been loving, important, and collected, traded, and closeted? These postcards have taken the epistolary exchange into ghastly territory. They constitute an archive of terror which provides a dark dead end for the body of imagery generated by Atlantic slavery and focused on the slave body in suffering for 400 years. They take the postcard for all in all, its lightness, its holiday spirit, its confidence, promiscuous public display as it leaves the sender's hand and sails brazenly and breezily through the methodical stages of the postal service and render it obscene. What did the postman think? and he put such stuff into letterboxes or handed them to the recipient. The fact that I can show you these things, the fact that I could source them so easily, illustrates the fact that they've now moved out or permanently been moved out of the world in which they were made. The conditions of exchange or give and take, of gift exchange, which produced them. This was a world, as the inscriptions and occasional stamps make all too clear, where the postcards were sent to commemorate a good day out. They were records of something seen as exciting, a leisure activity, entertainment, to be witnessed or experienced the way a football match or a day at the races or the zoo is exciting, just a little bit above the ordinary, yet still part of day to day life. The events they commemorated were special, but for the people who bought the cards, not truly extraordinary not that special, and above all accepted and acceptable, indeed respectable. And so part of the fascination now lies not only, in fact, only incidentally, in the record of extravagant ritualized violence, but also in the loss of context, the loss of a world of performance, of recording, of postal exchange, which is unrecoverable, although America may never recover from it. Here's another strange fact. The display of the history of lynching in the context of New Zealand, and indeed American and European culture generally, was fundamentally altered by a postcard collector. In 2000, James Allen's collection of photographs made photographic postcards of lynch and went on display for the first time. James Allen had begun to gather photographic postcards of lynchings in the mid-1970s. Exactly why, we'll probably never know. And in many ways, having met the man in Paris in 2002, I wouldn't want to know. This body of imagery was then the basis for a touring exhibition which was displayed at the Rob Horowitz Gallery in Manhattan, January the 13th to February the 12th, 2000, in an exhibition called Witness, and subsequently the New York Historical Society, under the more elaborate title, Without Sanctuary, Lynching Photography in America, March the 14th to August the 13th, and September the 1st to October the 1st, 2000. Lynching Photography in America. That title says a lot, as if there is lynching photography in America, as there is fashion photography in America, landscape photography in America, child photography in America, sport photography in America. Already a visual terror, a space of people which has a good claim to exist beyond description, has been absorbed into the museological centre, into display, into art, historical formularisation, and into the book trade, now into this conference. So let's confer about it. These peculiar photographic creations, often captured by amateurs and disseminated furtively in postcard form, are they pornographic? 
Are they the old style of pornography, the pornography that went out under the counter? The pornography that had to be smuggled out and handled physically and kept in stashes and cupboards and under beds, a dirty secret before the easy ubiquities of the world wide web. But now displaying the grand acceptance of the grand museums that have grandized the archive. These are no longer postcards showing atrocity, but have re-emerged as a subgenre in their own right. What's going around the walls here is now apparently, and then always was, lynching photography, an art form of like that, with its own aesthetic rules and regulations, a form which art historians are at liberty to unpick, to theorize, to revel in, claiming an aesthetico forensic clarity of cleanness, as if now it's all right to turn the lights on these things and perform thought tricks with them, the sort of thought tricks that can be applied to a painting the crucifixion or the martyrdom of Saint Sebastian or any other elevated act of priestly atrocity. And this lynching photography has now moved about and shown itself with a happy horror in a variety of locations in the States and Europe. This lynching photography is now, having been collected and catalogued, a collection inhabiting yet another of the It was my chosen job today to talk about the traumatic postcards manifested in lynching and so to think of the relation of the postcard to racism and hatred and murder. But the more I look at this stuff, the less meaning I find. What does it mean when this humble postal form, this casual and benign epistolary gesture associated with time off, with leisure industries, with comforting displacement, starts spitting jocular poison or turns approving receptive? The postcard is essentially a form which emerges and which is enabled by photography. It commonly advertises distance and mourns coexistence. It expresses removal and implies reunification. The postcard is situations. It's all about here and there. The postcard is testimonial. The postcard is a statement of separation. The postcard is addicted with one eye closed. Turn and turn about. A wink at spatial difference. Look at me and then see what they have written on my backside or my black inside. Read me, and then see what my outer skin has to say to your eyes. I am here, you are there, whether I wish you were here or not. I'm telling you that I was there. But what happens when the postcard turns up horror, when it's used to advertise a happy presence within a space, and looking in upon scenes which are nothing short of hellish? What happens when the call to be there makes the reader feel that there is the one place they would never want to be? What these peculiar, too sadly objects meant and have come to mean is not easily decided. A hanging body is always full of tension, more so when it's photographed. Was it swinging? Is it falling? Has it fallen? When will it be cut down? But formality is harder to impart. How do these images differ from other representations of public execution? There is, of course, a terrific artistic archive showing public or indeed state-sanctioned executions. And this is an archive which the lynching postcards run against the grain of, with their emphasis on speed, randomness, shoddiness, arbitrariness, mass production. There is all the difference in the world between the lynching postcard and the photograph shown in group executions, let's say, of the hanging of Lincoln's assassins. If these lynching images have any cellmates within the echelons of high art, maybe it's in the images of hanging generated around the group. It's the extemporary mass lynchings of Callum, or the pitiful little scenes of summary stringing up which are scattered through Boyd's disasters of war. If the lynching photographers are to have any commentary, then surely it's not what I have been saying, or I'm able to say, but it would be the direct transposition of those laconic, acerbic, compressed, hissing little aphorisms, which so smartly slap the reader in the face when they turn the pages of Goy's disasters of war, and which wrap up disgust for lost humanity in a twisted smile.